Welcome to the Chess Calculation Workshop, where you will learn how to calculate lines and combinations in your chess games properly. My name is Viktor Nyostroyev. I am a FIDE master and a chess coach. Currently, I am focusing on teaching chess online and offline. I have already brought up many students who became prize winners of their championships, of their towns and countries. However, I teach chess not only because of trophies, I like to make people's lives better, help them analyze it better and make better decisions. I designed this course for any chess player who struggles with calculation or just would like to improve his ability to calculate better and deeper and visualize the position properly after that. By the end of the course, you will be able to calculate the lines two, three moves deeper, picture that position in your mind and evaluate. What exactly do I teach in this course? I explain typical mistakes in calculation. I provide you with the exercises to improve and we do them together, where I explain which moves candidates to be looking for and demonstrate a step-by-step -step calculation process. That's why I called it a workshop. The ideal student for this course is a chess player who desires to improve his ability to calculate and visualize positions better. However, don't worry, there is no requirement needed to enroll. You just have to be open-minded and ready to learn. Thank you for your interest in my course Chess Calculation Workshop with video master Viktor Nyustroyev. Feel free to take a look at the course description and I look forward to see you there. Hello and welcome to my Chess Calculation Workshop. My name is Viktor Nyustroyev. I am a FIDE master and a coach. And in this video I will tell you what this course is about what exactly you will learn and how I organized our learning process. First of all, I tried to make this course interactive. So I'm not only explaining, but also asking you to suggest the moves, pause the videos and calculate the lines yourself first and only then continue watching my explanation. When speaking about calculation in chess, I believe the only way to improve it is to train a lot. That's why I'm sure that just watching these videos may help you a little bit. But if we do the exercises together, you will not only learn the technique of calculation, but also practice it yourself. This is how you can become a better chess player. This way of learning works more effectively. I have tested it together with my private students and proven it. In the first section, of the course I explain typical mistakes that chess players make in their games so that your task is to remember them and double check yourself every time you calculate a long line. The second section consists of the positions taken from real games where your task is to find moves candidates for you, choose the most promising and calculate it. And of course you should expect more than one response from your opponent. Calculating all logical responses is the key to success in chess game. Some positions are simple, some others are complicated. If you feel that this line is too complicated for you, just skip and get back to it later. Moreover, I pointed the level of each position in the title. In the third section of the course, we analyzed notable games played by grandmasters. And again, at a certain moment of the game, I ask you to pause the video and to calculate the lines yourself. This format is very common and effective for face-to-face -face lessons in chess schools. Calculating lines within a chess game teaches you to be able to look for combinations when you play your own games. Finally, I also prepared homework for you, so you can train yourself without any help from my side. If you follow my instructions and at least try to complete all these exercises yourself first, 
and then compare your solutions to what I suggested in the video, you will definitely improve your ability to calculate and visualize properly. And of course, will improve your chess performance. Because calculation is a part and parcel of chess. Thank you for your attention and see you inside the course. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Hello everyone, this is FIDE Master Viktor Neustroyev and this is the first lecture of my course devoted to calculation skills. And in this first lecture we are going to talk about mistakes and calculation that you may uh, make and uh, which I want you to avoid in your future games. So that's why where I'm going to explain them, you will learn and every time when you calculate a combination or just a certain line, you make sure that everything is properly and you are not making such a mistake. I tried to make this uh, course interactive. I am going to ask questions and try to answer yourself. So when I'm asking and saying that you should pause the video and try to find the solution yourself, please do it. It's quite important for your future progress and uh, for your ability to calculate the lines properly. Uh, try to think yourself and after that uh, please uh, watch my explanation and the correct answer. Okay, so this is the first type of the mistakes. Uh, the, the name is unforeseen check. Uh, Black played a rook b6 in this position. There is something that they had in mind with such a move. What do you think? What did they have in mind with rook b6? Did they just want to trade the rooks or maybe there was a certain idea behind this move? Uh, of course, trading rooks is in black favor because white's rooks are more active and rook c7 is not a problem, just rook d6 and uh, black trades the other rook pair and uh, simplifies the position and finally equalizes it. Okay. Please pause this video and try to realize what was the idea behind rook b6 move. Okay, I'm sure you found, but if not, please look at the screen. The idea was that this rook is protected only with the knight. That's why if white captures the knight, king takes and white can successfully take the rook. Looks quite attractive for white, but actually this is a trap. In this position, after white captures on b6, black can simply play king c7 to trap the rook on b6. I'll show you on the board. So for example, if white plays rook d7, king d7, rook b6, king c7, the rook is trapped. Uh, white has to sacrifice this rook for a pawn, for the e6 pawn, and then black is a winning. That was the idea, to get uh, the rook trapped after rook d7 and rook takes b6. However, there was something that black missed in this combination. That was an unforeseen check. So again, please pause this video and try to find what black missed, how white can improve this combination to be able to get a better or a winning position. Maybe with the extra material. Okay, I think you had enough time to find it. Uh, the idea is not only to take on b6, but first to protect the rook on c6. And white can successfully do it with an intermediate check. Rook d7, king d7, and finally knight to e5. Checking the king, and at the same time protecting the rook. After this check, the king has to retreat and can't protect the rook on b6. King e7, rook takes b6, and white is winning because of an extra knight. Okay. I think you got it. So the idea of rook b6 could be good because it uh, attracted white to play 
рук uh, d7, but unfortunately, black overlook an intermediate check knight e5. This is what can happen very often, especially if the king is close to the place of action. Okay, fine. Thank you for your attention. We will continue in the next video with another type of mistakes in calculation. Hello everyone, this is Fido Master Viktor Neustroyev and in this section we start exercises that will help you to improve your ability to calculate. If in the previous lectures we were talking about mistakes in calculations that I wanted you to remember and to avoid them in your future games, here we are going to do a lot of practice and of course when I ask you try to calculate the lines yourself and only then um, look at the screen and uh, follow my arrows and uh, the moves that I play on the board. Okay, this is the first exercise, uh, which is quite difficult. Uh, the second and the third one a little bit easier, but let me show this one because uh, this is a good uh, and sharp position that definitely requires calculation and can successfully illustrate the ability of calculating the line properly. What can you uh, notice here? It's white to move, white pieces are much more active, at the same time uh, the bishop and knight are under the attack, and uh, uh, black is about to trade a few pieces, um, simplify and finally finish their problems with the development, after which their, their position won't be losing. Um, maybe they can even equalize. So what do you think white should do? Here you can pause this video and spend uh, from 10 to 30 minutes, even to 30 minutes, uh, to uh, find the next move and uh, calculate all the lines properly. What are our moves candidates? What do you think? Of course, we can play in a simple way. We can just take on c5, bishop takes c5, and then we retreat with our bishop maybe to h4 to protect the pawn. Then our position will be slightly better. What else? Just retreating with the bishop means we blunder. Maybe this check, but after this check, bishop takes d6, rook takes d6, and our bishop on g5 is still hanging. While all our pieces are taken, we should be looking for active options. That's why the other move candidate to consider here is rook to g8. What does this move do? So please uh, suggest the moves that black can play after rook d8. What are their moves candidates? Of course, I'm sure you understand that with rook d8 we are threatening with a checkmate. For example, knight e5, f takes e5, and uh, bishop e8. If after rook e8 no, they play something, uh, we play knight e5, they play with the king to e7, then rook e8 delivers a checkmate. I can show it on the board. So rook d8, for example, some move, knight e5. If pawn takes, then bishop e8 is a checkmate. If here king moves, then it's rook e8 mate. So that's why we should definitely analyze such moves because the, this move creates a threat. Uh, what to expect from black? What are their moves candidates? Again, if you need, you may pause this video and try to uh, find the solution yourself. If you think it's too complicated, just uh, follow my arrows, try to picture the position in your mind. Okay, of course, uh, knight takes e4 is a good move candidates f takes g5, another possible option. What else? Well, probably bishop e7 as the alternative to these two moves. Let's calculate everything. So which move to start with? 
Let's start with something simple. It's always easier to calculate first a simple line. For example, f takes g5, knight e5, king e7, rook e8, delivers a checkmate. Perfect. Then, the second line is knight takes e4. How to play then? What should be, what should we look for? For a check, for example, it can be bishop e8, but if bishop e8 after king e7, it's not easy to find another move. So, for example, bishop e8, king e7, and what then? What else can be done? Knight e5, probably. Knight e5, check, and after knight e5, he has two options. Of course, if pawn takes, we deliver a checkmate on e8. That was our original idea. If after this move, they play maybe, what? King e7. We may continue with rook e8 check. So the king goes to d6 because there is no knight e4 and uh, it's not a mate. However, in such a case, we should continue with knight f7, check. King moves either c5 or c7. For example, if it goes to c5, we can check with our bishop on e3 to be able to save the bishop. They will capture the other bishop on b5, and then just rook f8. It's difficult to imagine, but let's calculate the material. Can you picture this position in your mind? So let's calculate the number of pieces um, and compare. Well, white has a rook on f8, bishop on e3 and knight on f7. Black has the knight on e4. King is already on b5. So the rook on h8 is trapped. So black will be up the material. And after this rook is taken, I think it's extra exchange. Rook versus knight. Okay, fine. Uh, let's now calculate the case when the king goes to c7. I'll repeat the line, it will be easier. Rook d8, knight takes e4, knight e5 check, king goes to e7, rook e8 check, king goes to d6, here knight f7 fork, this is how we also secure the knight and trap the rook. King goes to c7, rook takes f8, then what? Probably they can take on g5, but if they do that, uh, then uh, I think the best uh, that we can do is just to capture the rook on h8. Let's now compare the material. Again, we have The bishop on b5 is still alive, so we have two minor pieces. Black has three minor pieces, but they lost a rook. So we are up the exchange. So in this variation, we gain the exchange at least. Maybe if black makes a mistake, even more. Especially because his pieces are not developed. Okay, I'm going to show uh, all these lines on the board, but I'll do it a little bit later. Okay, what then? After rook d8, we calculated what happens in case of knight e4. Uh, the other move candidate in this position is bishop e7. How to play after bishop e7? What do you think? Again, if you didn't calculate this line before, please pause this video right now and try to find the solution. Okay, in such a case, you should continue still with knight e5. f takes e5. Then it's a little bit difficult to come up with the second move. It should be a check. 
96 check. The idea of such a check is to get rid of this bishop on e7. Because if not the bishop, for example, if bishop takes on d6, we may play bishop e8 check, king goes to f8, and just move the bishop out from the e8 square to deliver a check with our d8 rook. Let's say bishop g6 or h5. And this is a checkmate. Okay, of course, you may say, what if they don't take the knight on d6 and play with the king to g6? I'll show the line again. Rook d8, bishop e7, knight e5 check, f takes e5, knight d6. That was the line when bishop takes this knight on d6. Now, what if king goes to g6? If king goes to g6, we can just capture on e7 with our bishop. And they can't capture back because their knight is pinned. So the knight on g8 is pinned because we already have the rook on the 8th rank. They have to play something after which we can also capture this bishop. So how much material do we get? We have two bishops plus knight, while black is likely to lose both their bishops. So will will be a piece up, maybe even more. Okay. If you could uh, picture this position in your mind, it's really great. It means that you are a strong player, maybe around 18 or 1900. If not, then at least you understand what you should do to be able to visualize these positions. Well, I can give you one more small tip. If you can't picture the position, try to repeat the line from the very beginning until you clearly can picture it in your mind. Okay, now let me show you all the lines. So rook d8. Well, the first line is f takes g5, after which knight e5 check, king goes e7, and rook e8 is a mate. What if instead they capture on e4? We play knight e5. And again, if pawn takes, then this is another checkmate with bishop e8. If in this position, instead of taking on e5, they move the king to e7, then rook e8. King has to go to d6. This is the only square. Knight f7, check, fork. And if now king goes to c5, we can do what? Just save our dark squared bishop, let them take on b5, but we capture the rook and then one of these two pieces. Actually, let's capture the bishop first and then capture the rook successfully because they can't escape. So black uh, will be down the exchange, at least down the exchange, maybe even more, because we can, for example, chase, deliver a check on d6 later in the game. If king c7 instead, then rook f8, the enemy rook is still trapped on h8, so they capture at least our bishop, we take there, again we up the exchange. Oh, this line may be continued with this move, knight f4, and then rook f7. And also we may capture the knight, or maybe instead, if they play king d8, we capture on g7 just. This is how we can also win two pawns, the g7 and the h7 one. Okay, and finally bishop e7, I think the most complicated line. If so, still knight e5, king has no squares to move, they have to take. Now uh, we play knight d6 of course, and if bishop takes on d6, this is a very nice checkmate with two bishops and a rook on d8. If they don't take, then just bishop e7. This is how we gain a piece back. So right now the material is equal, but actually this is a pin. So the bishop is likely to be lost, unfortunately. Uh, then this is a pin. So they are in a real trouble. Knight e7 cannot be played, just rook h8. And again, white is winning. If, let's say, something to secure the king, then b4 knight 
move somewhere we can even take and then capture on c8 if knight is seven then knight takes knight with a check and uh, we have extra knight in such a case so still a winning position but you don't need to calculate so deep you should just understand that here you are already up the material at least the position is in your favor. Actually, materially it's equal, but because of the bishop being hanging on c8 and because of this pin that you are going to uh, exploit, you are likely to win something. So that's why uh, you sh may stop your uh, calculation process here and just evaluate that white is almost winning. Okay, fine. So thank you for your attention. That was a difficult exercise. And uh, if you would like to practice, you can yeah, just use any puzzles or any sharp positions and try to calculate moves. And every time when you decide that you should play maybe rook d8 or something else, uh, look for different moves candidates and try to calculate all these lines in the depth of uh, three, four moves at least. And after a week of such exercises, you will realize that your ability to calculate the lines properly got improved. Okay, thank you for your attention. We will continue in the next video.